Hi, I'm Professor Nora Colton, and I'm the director of the Global Business School for Health. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about global health systems. Uh, I'm going to talk about different frameworks and the context in which they uh, exist in. It's a really exciting and important topic, and I hope you enjoy the lecture and in, moreover enjoy the module uh, that we put together for you. So first of all, I just want to talk uh, briefly about the learning outcomes and what you can anticipate in this lecture. What I'm going to try to do today is really help you gain insights into why there is no real consensus on the conceptualization and effectiveness of health systems, and moreover, health system strengthening. I think it's a really important and exciting topic, and, and when you start to put it together and see it in context and, and in terms of history, I think it will help you as you start to think about reimagining health and healthcare. So first of all, uh, I want you to be able to develop a, a deep in insights into what health systems are, understand the, the influence of these health systems frameworks, and also the wider kind of political uh, economy um, and society in which they sit in. So I very much subscribe to the idea that the development of health systems and frameworks and thinking and even your thinking is very much impacted by the time in which you live in, the things that are going on around you, uh, you know, the, the kind of politics, uh, both geopolitics, local politics, national politics, um, the economy, of course, is, is also paramount. So it's not just about focusing on health. We have to focus on that wider sphere, and that's where that kind of systems and system thinking become very important. But having said that, it's also cru critical for us to understand um, health and, and health systems and uh, the organizations that exist to try to strengthen those health systems. So first of all, what's a health system? Well, according to the World Health Organization, a health system consists of all the organizations, institutions, resources, and people whose primary purpose is to improve health. So that's quite a definition. This includes efforts to influence determinants of health, such as education and socioeconomic variables, as well as direct health and healthcare activities. So one of the important things I want you to take away from that definition is that this is not just reserved for the state. It's not reserved just for public organizations. It includes uh, private and public partnerships, non-governmental organizations, charities, and a key activity of organizations interested in kind of supporting the development of health systems. Um, and, and that can come in lots of different forms. It can come around the workforce development. It can be professional bodies. It can be resources, supply chain management, uh, the kinds of facilities, hospitals, clinics, the places in which health and healthcare take place. And, and probably one of the most important topics that we'll, we'll talk about, and, and I'm sure you'll talk about throughout your programs, is funding. Uh, you know, where, where is the money come from? How is healthcare funded? Uh, you know, and, and where is it going? So along with understanding that kind of broad definition and really thinking about health and health care. And again, the reason I say health and health care is because health care often means the therapeutics, the treatment uh, of, of people's uh, illnesses and, and, and the kind of correction of their, their health. Whereas health is a much wider terminology because it takes in really prevention, uh, you know, the, again, those social determinants, things like education and income and diet, um, and, you know, really also not just prevention, but diagnostics. And, and, and we see so much work and effort being put into to those two areas. So even when we talk about uh, healthcare management, really in this school and in this program, you're going to be talking mainly about health management today because that takes in so much more. So along with that comes a, a real different kind of thinking about uh, the main actors that make up our health system. So we have historically had, if we wind back, believe it or not, it wasn't until after World War II that as a global community, 
we started to become much more concerned about the health and health care of each other. So the World Health Organization was not founded until 1948. And of course, the mandate of the World Health Organization was to help to bring the countries together to really help create a global governance, to work as a world community to really address diseases and, and all those uh, other areas of, of health. And part of that, of course, is also thinking about health systems and taking a more systemic uh, uh, you know, approach and thinking more about uh, what was called health of the people. Uh, you know, the idea that everyone should be able to have basic health uh, as part of being part of mankind. And so it was a really important, you know, uh, endeavor, uh, really. Uh, you know, and one of the first things the World Health Organization did was get consensus on what do we mean by the word health? Uh, so the World Health also has what's called the World Health Assembly, which is all the member countries. It's part of the UN, so it's a UN agency, and it's, it's funded through, you know, the membership. Uh, now, you'll see as I move forward in this lecture, uh, I'll give you a few examples of, of where the, the World Health Organization has had a bigger role and sometimes less of a role. And much of that has been, uh, you know, because of changes in the world economy, the countries that are, are, are more pressing, those who pay more membership dues tend to often feel that they have more of a stay. So the United Nations uh, organizations in general are often challenged in, in their role. But I believe very firmly that the World Health Organization is an incredible institution and has a very important mandate. Um, and, and that continual governance uh, of the world health system is, is so important. Now, alongside there, just formed a few years earlier, was the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. UNICEF. Uh, again, very important in terms of uh, particularly for children in, in low income country, conflict zones, um, you know, other types of health emergencies. Uh, and, and they and the World Health Organization for a long time uh, were the only two, you know, main actors, as it were, in, in this whole health system strengthening. Uh, um, and playing this kind of pivot role in, in the global health system. Now, the World Bank I have down there, and you'll see that it was actually founded before both of those organizations, and it was, it, it was not, not and is not set up mainly for health. But given its mandate and its role and how it's evolved as an organization over time, it's actually played much more uh, uh, of a health role than, than was originally could have ever been imagined or expected. The World Bank was set up uh, along with the International Monetary Fund, um, and they both are what we call uh, post-Brinton -Brin Woods organizations. Brinton Woods is where the world leaders met to really create the monetary system that existed after World War II, and, and it was um, you know, a, a gold exchange uh, kind of system. And so the International Monetary Fund was set up, of course, to, to oversee that system. But the World Bank was the economic development arm, and it went in to try to help countries stabilize their economies to help bring about more and better monetary stability, also often providing loans and funding to organizations and countries um, in, in that pursuit. But over time, as you'll see as I go through this lecture, the World Bank, because things are so interconnected, um, has played a, a very important role in kind of the, the discourse around health and health care. And then other UN agencies have also been involved. Of course, the United Nations Development Program, which was founded in 1965, has again been a very important organization for really uh, setting a view and a vision because it works on lots of projects, mainly in low and middle income countries, um, and the spillover effect to health is, is imperative. Uh, and then there's also been some real key international, more charitable foundations that have been set up over time. Many of them have played a, a, an incredible role in actually shaping 
uh, much of the mandate and thinking around health and health care. And so I mentioned just three there, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and the Ford Foundation. Those are three that that we are particularly uh, you know, no, known and, and have played uh, roles in terms of health system strengthening. And of course, there are lots of other development agencies. Most uh, European countries and uh, many other uh, developed countries have their own development agencies in which they uh, often will give bilateral aid to particular countries or fund projects in different countries. So again, they're a very important kind of global actor. On the state level, there are also numerous actors and it can vary from country to country. So I've just mentioned a few there. Of course, uh, you know, ministries of health uh, is, are, are very important and, and where lots of the thinking at a, a national level will go on. Uh, but of course, the ministry of health has to work very closely with the Ministry of Finance because that's where the money is held. And so, you know, even if I think about the, the UK and the National Health Service, of course, uh, you know, the NHS is uh, very vulnerable to the kind of national budget and, and the, the setting of that budget and how much money they're allocated, which isn't always about how much they would like or they feel they need uh, to meet the kind of demand, it, it has all sorts of kind of trade-offs. So every country, by the way, is making trade-offs when they're thinking about health and health care. And then, of course, there's numerous state uh, health regulatory agencies. Their titling might be different, but their oversight can be things like the overall health system, uh, you know, things like hospitals, uh, you know the the you know who who can you know operate you know the the way they they will work with professional bodies often uh, they they're also drugs manufacturers medical devices and so these these agencies play a very important role as part of our our health system and then we have of course our local actors and that can be regional district community health organizations that span really a, a wide uh, you know, group of uh, you know, different entities. And so I've just listed hospitals, clinics, and health services, but of course, it's much more than that. And then finally, just some other actors. We see today lots of private-public partnerships that are really important to the health system, um, NGOs and charities, both small, medium, and large charities that are, are engaged in different aspects, sometimes focused on individual diseases, um, but also, uh, you know, some that are focused on treatments and then some that are, you know, focused on the wider health system. And then, of course, the, the work alongside other uh, industries. And we see as the health ecosystem really expands that the, the industries and sectors that historically we thought about being associated with health care have increased. But you know, some of those are pharmaceuticals, of course, biotechnology, and then technology in general is, is becoming such an important, it's a catchword for many different industries that um, work on from different angles on, on our health system. So, why do we need frameworks then for monitoring health, health system? Well, because the system is so large and so complex uh, with, with so many multiple uh, actors and layers for really delivering you know, prevention, diagnostics, treatment and care, then we need really these key indicators of effectiveness and, and really understanding the trade-offs and making decisions and kind of prioritizing and setting a strategic agenda to do all that, both at the global and national level then for uh, various aspects of our health system, we need a way to put it into something that's digestible, understandable. So of course, just like any model or theory, there's always gonna be exceptions to the rules. There's gonna be some aspects that we might not quite like or understand. We may not feel that all of these modules are comprehensive enough. And last but not least, one of the things that I want to demonstrate to you as I take you through some of these different mo mod models or frameworks, as, as we call them, is that you're going to come to appreciate that actually many of these uh, frameworks are very contextualized in the time in which they evolve. 
So history plays a very important role in telling the story of kind of health systems, how we think about them, how our thinking has evolved um, since the uh, creation, particularly of the World Health Organization. So I'm going to take you through six models now. Uh, Donna Beaton uh, framework, the World Health Organization infrastructure framework, the Romer framework, the Frank framework, the World Bank control knobs framework, and the World Health Organization building block framework. So let's get going. So one of the things that I want to just say is that none of these frameworks are perfect. Uh, and part of having a framework is to try to understand those common elements. But one of the things that you're going to see is that there are some key areas that keep coming up. They are the what I'd call the key components of health systems. But what we'll notice is it's more the nuance around them. Um, and some of it, as I just mentioned, has to do with the, the time in history in which the model arose. Um, and then it, some others have to do with kind of the strategic thinking around health systems. Um, and, and, you know, of course, like any uh, area of uh, study or discipline uh, where you're dealing with lots of different actors and approaches, there, there is no one consensus about just what makes up, you know, kind of the perfect health system. So, uh, but what we can do is learn lots of lessons from lots of different health systems and understand, you know, the emphasis and, you know, what prioritizing one thing over another in, in a health system. What does it lead to? How does it impact uh, the society? So there's some really important questions that come out of, of, of studying health systems, not only in thinking about how you need to strengthen them to really have good health care, um, uh, but also identifying the weaknesses and then understanding, you know, what are the lessons that we can learn? You know, what what was it the country X did that was different than than another country and, and the kinds of trade offs that they faced and how did it impact their society? How did it impact the health of their nation and their population? So this is why studying health systems and looking at different frameworks and understanding them and getting that kind of historical context is going to be really important for you as a student at the Global Business School for Health for really starting to reimagine and thinking about what that health system is, why it's evolving the way it is, why are we prioritizing what we are, what is the role of politics, what is the role of the economy, what is the, the role of the wider society. So in this first framework, uh, you'll see that it, it's really focused on three areas. And this, uh, I'll talk just a minute. I'm just going to show you first the diagram so you can see what, what it looks like and start to kind of imagine this. So it's got really three areas in it. It's got structure. So thinking again uh, about you know, where we were in terms of health systems in the 1966, um, and, and thinking back, much of the focus was on, uh, you know, medical research um, and health services within a medical context and particularly those within a hospital context. So thinking that way, what, what is the contribution this model makes? And it is very important because uh, and, and it's considered a classic model. We, we, we come back to this uh, Donna Baden model very often uh, because it really has the structure, process, and outcome. So how we define outcomes has changed over time. And, and what we think about the processes may change over the time. And the structures of the entities may change over time. But this kind of thinking and putting it into these nice three pots, as it were, has been really important for the evolution and, and kind of approach to health care. So by structure, we mean physical and organizational characteristics. So kind of the service models, uh, you know, the continuity of care, you know, kind of training and education that goes into those who deliver the care. All of that then is, is that structural bit. And then the processes focuses on the care, the actual care that's delivered to the patients. So uh, again, inequality of access, how how um, patients are communicated with, 
the kind of relationship between the provider and the patient. And then last but not least is outcomes. Um, you know, the fact that that uh, intervention, that health care uh, has had on the status of the patient, um, their families, the care, uh, you know, and, and part of that is, too, you know, the satisfaction of the patient, you know, what, what was the patient's experience? You know, did they they get the um, you know, preferences that were they listened to um, and, and also recognizing that wider need of, of their family and their care? So really, when you think about it, a very simple and yet very important model. So the important kind of aspects of this model then are uh, it's, as I said, it's credited with being really the first attempt to kind of conceptualize these domains. And that's really uh, stuck in terms of healthcare uh, systems thinking. Um, and then, uh, moreover, uh, that process bit, that part about the patient and the provider, as well as just uh, the final status of the patient, which is really important and continues to be in our, our minds. And when we think about patient-centered healthcare, is really important today. Uh, one of the real strengths of this model then is it, it's general enough to be applied across several diverse healthcare settings. So uh, again, sometimes you know the the uh, beauty, as it were, is in the simplicity. Um, and and also this model has been used not just to think about the wider general health system, but also apply to certain individual diseases. So that really, uh, you know, makes this model very interesting. Um, where the critics come in is really that they see this more as just kind of classification uh, and, uh, and, and it misses really many of the, the kind of tensions that go on within our health services, the bigger environmental issues, as I've, I've pointed out already. Uh, so, so that's why, as I said, it's really important to think about the time that this model evolved um, because health thinking was just broadening beyond medical interventions at the time. So uh, it wasn't really until the 1970s that that push for, you know, kind of more general focus and, and a focus away from just medicine and more on uh, primary health care and health started to take off. So very interesting model. Then the next one I wanted to, to bring to your attention is this, uh, the WHO's infrastructure framework. Now, this model is the, you know, in many ways, the opposite of the previous one I showed you. It's much more complex. Uh, it came, uh, you know, it was first published in 1984, and um, it really tries to capture uh, and again, I'll talk in a minute about just the, the, the point in history and why why it's so. So it goes a little step further. It's got if you look there on the side, you can see it's got the health systems infrastructure. It's got the output functions and then it's got kind of the target areas and people. So it's got the physical and social environment. Um, that we need to uh, think about that influences health, um, the different population groups, uh, families and individuals in need of care. And then, you know, it's got that, um, you know, the, the kind of health promotion, the kind of prevention of illness, uh, you know, very much health education, the kind of public health space, as well as the diagnostics and treatment and disease rehabilitation, which leads down there then to that wider kind of infrastructure area where you've got the development of your health resources, how you arrange them, how you deliver health care, the economic imperatives, and then, of course, management as well, which is, is really important. So to understand the significance of this framework and why I selected it as one that I wanted you to, to show you and, and, and to have you reflect on, is that the particular time in the kind of larger geopolitical context. Uh, so as I just mentioned, the uh, Dunbay Dun uh, model is really from a period where uh, you know the uh, healthcare delivery was was what was so important. For this model, we were now in moving into the 1970s and coming off the back of really a, a very tough time uh, economically in the world. So 
you know, for those that may not know, of course, in the 1970s, we had a lot of uncertainty. We had an oil crisis. There was a war uh, that, that tripped uh, lots of conflict that in the Middle East that spilled over to the rest of the world. And it led to really some uh, very long periods uh, of inflation. And so it, it really saw a pullback uh, from some of the earlier thinking around health of the people um, and, and health care, which had all sorts of implications. Uh, so just about that time, and as I just said to you a minute ago, there was this movement towards a focus on primary care uh, and becoming more targeted uh, to different segments of the population. Um, and then with the kind of pullback, uh, that primary care got reinterpreted to specific diseases. So again, a kind of a, a narrowing down of the focus. Um, and then also what we started to see happen, because countries were having such economic problems, uh, the World Bank started to rise up and start to take a more prominent role. And that was because many countries were getting into economic distress. Um, and that, that kind of Brenton Wood uh, economic system, of course, uh, came to an end in the early 70s. Um, and, and, and so countries were going through, many countries were going through a lot of uh, monetary and economic upheaval. And so the World Bank, uh, you know, took on this role of really coming in and doing a lot of structural changes and recommending changes and, and, and really in some cases, you know, uh, creating what was known as structural adjustment programs where for countries to get loans from the International Monetary Fund and uh, the World Bank, they would have to adhere to a certain, you know, kind of diet, as it were, in terms of how they managed and, and, and worked in their economy. Of course, that then is spilled over to health because, as we just saw in the previous slide with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance, they're very interlinked. So there was this movement away then from, you know, previous models, from healthcare delivery, even, you know, a, a different take on primary health care, as I've just said, uh, and a movement towards more national health systems. Uh, so this infrastructure framework began to expand that focus of analysis, uh, you know, looking at national health systems, um, and but also including these things like resource and the management of the system. So also, uh, you know, uh, along that kind of same line then came this uh, Romer uh, health systems framework. And I just, again, want to show you the diagram so you can see what it looks like. And then I'm going to take you through uh, some different aspects here. So this one, uh, you know, again, looks very simple uh, relative to, to the one I just showed you. Um, but it, it's actually a very interesting model because the focus there is really on the organization of programs. So on the surface, it doesn't look like, you know, a, a very powerful model or, or like it adds a lot of in, insights uh, above and beyond, say, what I've already shown you. But actually, in truth, it really does, because well, that that organization of programs is really the heart of the module model. Sorry. And the major contribution of this model is it, the introduction of thinking about different types of health systems in terms of a continuum. And, and there were some other models that came out around this same time. And that continuum was really around this idea of kind of market-based private health systems versus fully public systems. And of course, all health systems, if you look out into the world even today, you see that kind of continuum still exists where, um, you know, and, and universal health is defined in different ways in different countries. You know, many use insurance and insurance systems. Sometimes those systems are underwritten by the government or paid mainly by the government. Um, and and so uh, and then some systems are much more focused on private. M you know, much higher levels of out-of-pocket kind of expenses for health uh, by individuals. Uh, and, and of course, on the extremes, I would say, you know, you have on the one hand, a nationalized kind of health service system in the UK. On the other end, you have the more entrepreneurial private system of the US. 
And then you have all the rest of the world that sits kind of somewhere in between there making up health systems. So what he did was with this model is that you can then classify health systems. And that's where that organization of programs comes into place. Um, so either nationalized, uh, mandated, or entrepreneurial are the three areas he kind of put them in. So as I said, you've got the extremes and then the kind of mandated, which is that mixed economy in the middle. Uh, so this way model was really, in many ways, builds upon the, the kind of infrastructure model that I just showed you by describing existing health systems, but with a much bigger focus on the role of government control of health systems organizations. And um, this model is often credited with really taking us into that kind of a sphere of understanding health systems in their wider context in terms of the political frameworks in which they, they operate in. Uh, so, again, very interesting. This leads me then to the next model, which, again, is very contextualized. Uh, this, this model, which, uh, you know, this was from a publication in 2000, is a, a, a framework that focuses much more on performance. It's a performance model. And so if you, you look, you know, in stewardship there, which runs across uh, or, 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 I'm sorry, vertically, is concerned with financing, provision, and resource generation. And resource generation is concerned with financing, provision, and stewardship. So, again, really the focus of this model, and, and it shouldn't surprise you given, given the timing, is very much around finance. Um, you know, uh, there was really a push at this period for lowering costs and, and trying to um, healthcare uh, more efficient. So just to give you the kind of lead up to this model then, in the 1990s we saw really a consolidation of the World Bank in terms of the health sector. Uh, and, and as I've already pointed out, we saw kind of the demise of the World Health Organization. It, it started to play less of an important role. The World Bank um, you know, was a very paramount for many countries, particularly low-income countries, countries in, in the global south, many of them who were uh, found themselves in economic distress, would go to the um, IMF, the World Bank. Part of going to the IMF would mean that you'd have to have a structural adjustment program put in place by the World Bank, uh, and, and part of that then would have that spill over to uh, health. So, Although the World Health Organization was there and it was providing services, its importance uh, to many of the states that it wanted to influence became uh, minimized uh, at the expense uh, you know, of, of this kind of system that had evolved around the IMF and the World Bank. So not surprising then, given the mandate, given the fact that part of what the World Bank was doing is trying to get countries into a state where they could pay back their loans and that they could, you know, stabilize their, uh, you know, uh, monetary system. Uh, cost containment uh, became worldwide as, as an important part of the deliverables. The other interesting thing about the 90s and the lead up to this, this model I just showed you is that HIV and AIDS uh, played a, a really important role in the 90s in terms of shaping much of our thinking about global health um, and, and also in terms of kind of a treatment approach. So again, uh, you know, this idea, it, 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 we'd seen it previously around primary care uh, where, uh, you know, we started out and the World Health Organization started out with much bigger kind of remit around primary care and then, and then, you know, it became very disease specific uh, when we, you know, in the 70s, as we, at late 70s and into the early 80s. So again, in the 90s, we see that, that approach coming back, be, uh, but more around kind of the, the importance of treatment uh, uh, as a basic right for uh, certain illnesses and diseases versus a more health systems approach. So by the time we get to 2000 then, when this framework that I, I you know, the, the Frank's framework began, uh, you know, the number of actors that made up the health system, A, were expanding. Because the other thing about AIDS and HIV is that um, 
it really spoke to a lot of people. And so a lot more NGOs and private organizations and funders started to really get involved in, in this kind of health space. And uh, particularly in places like Africa, where we saw much more private public partnerships starting to evolve between um, you know, national health authorities and, and, and private entities, NGOs, charities. So this really advanced our thinking about health systems by, by focusing on questions uh, also about, you know, why certain countries uh, with very similar profiles, some would be able to deliver much different kind of more significant results in terms of health care and health systems than others. Uh, so this, this framework then being focused on measurements performance is understandable because the idea was to try to understand what is it? What, what drives? Because it obviously then isn't income alone. Um, you know, your GP, uh, GDP level isn't the only indicator of a good health system. So that's why these kind of four areas, stewardship, financing, service provision, and research generation are, are so important to this framework um, as it tries to answer this really important question of, you know, health systems performance uh, and, and, you know, why certain systems better than others. The other important thing is that the year that this framework uh, was published was also the year that the World Health Report, Health Systems Improving Performance, was published. Uh, and again, it was very important in, in terms of, you know, putting out there a, a, a redefinition of health systems beyond health services, but also looking at, you know, how do we evaluate, how do we monitor, how do we understand the performance of health systems. So now I'd like to take you uh, uh, to another mo model that, uh, or framework that came out about the same time, just a few years later. And again, not surprising, it's a World Bank uh, uh, model. Uh, it's called Rob, it was done by uh, someone called Roberts. Uh, he was the, the main author and, and person uh, that, that you know, uh, got this model uh, developed. Um, and it's called the Control Knobs Framework. So how this works, so if you, you look there where it says the health system, and again, you see some words that keep prop, you know, coming back, financing, payment, organization, regulation, and behavior. So this thinking is those are the knobs. So one of the important things about this model is the idea that governments have control. They are the ones that are at the knobs who are shaping the health system by the way they they control these knobs or, or levers. And then that leads to either efficiency, quality, access, um, and with the overall performance goals, of course, being, you know, uh, you know, for your population, you know, the health status of your population. You know, how healthy are they? How long do they live? You know, what is the quality of their life? You know, how, how satisfied is your population with, you know, um, the health and health care that they receive, you know, in, in addition to, to outcomes. And then, of course, uh, the risk protection. And when we talk about risk protection, we're really talking about financial risk. You know, the, the idea that people can um, be wiped out, um, you know, can, can be impoverished by um, poor health. Uh, and so this, this, again, very interesting uh, model that came about. So what are the important aspects of this model? Uh, well, this model is seen as going a, a step further than the, the one I showed you before by the World Health Organization by asking the question, what factors influence how well the health functions perform? And uh, the idea, as I just said, uh, of these control knobs then are they are adjusted by governments to improve health systems performance. So, you know, the government's being really in control of these levers and, and the institutional drivers. So, again, financing, who pays and who benefits from health care, payment, the ways in which money is transferred to health providers. Um, and then, of course, regulation, the use of state coercion and control to the behaviors of uh, actors in the system and then organization, the incentives of, for organizations, the incentives, the authority, the skills, the attitude of both managers and, and, and workers. 
And then last but not least, behaviors, you know, information provision, marketing, incentives, coercion, uh, shaping how patients and providers act in relationship to health and health care. So very similar, uh, but but some very interesting subtleties about how this, um, you know, framework was seen and used. So the last framework that I'm going to talk to you about is was in 2010, and that's the, the World Health Organization Health Systems Framework. And again, you see it's, it's a, a kind of a functional uh, framework focused on a number of what uh, the, the World Health Organization terms system building blocks. So uh, again, service delivery, uh, the health workforce. So this is something that should catch your eye workforce now very much front and center a very important part uh, of health systems information systems um, and that again the idea of how information is gathered how it's analyzed how it's collated uh, data and questions around data and uh, and and those aspects of, of health Access to essential medicines, uh, uh, you know, that, that's there uh, in the other models in terms of resources. Financing, of course, remains very, very important. But also we've got here leadership and governance. Um, and, and, you know, though that's been a theme throughout, its emphasis has not been overstated. And it's not overstated here, by the way. Um, you know, one of the criticisms of this model actually is that it, it's, it's a very functional model. And then Again, you've got a kind of that intermediate area around access coverage and quality and safety, leading to those overall goals or outcomes of improved health, which is, uh, you know, the term before kind of equity and leveling, responsiveness, you know, uh, social and financial risk, again, being very important, but we've added social there and, and, and improving efficiencies. So this framework really offers a kind of a, a core set of functions um, that can be identified and be looked at critically in terms of health sy systems. I think important too that we're in 2010 now and it's reinvigorating the health systems thinking. This idea of, of an inventory approach like many of those before it, but really putting it together and, and reaffirming from the World Health Organization's standpoint the importance of systems and systems thinking. The approach doesn't, however, though, tell us about all the stakeholders. And of course, we know by 2010 and we know today that the number of stakeholders, uh, the complexity of health systems and how they interact is so important for measuring and understanding and performance and outcomes. So the approach also assumes that there's patients involved in healthcare, but they're not explicit in this model. And I, I've actually seen someone who's taken this framework and try to insert a, another element of patients, uh, because as we all know, patients are core to the future of health systems and how we think about health systems. Um, and so, and, and we have seen uh, across this, this kind of tour of different health frameworks, uh, the, the, the role of patients um, you know, sometimes indirectly, but sometimes directly, you know, mentioned. So the value of this framework is really in identifying that key set of variables as, and, and, you know, obviously now with, uh, you, know, you know, something like almost, you know, 60 years of knowledge, uh, you know, we, we, we're still coming back to lots of key areas and, and the importance, of course, uh, of outcomes for improving health. Uh, the response and the needs and the financial protection, all of these elements are uh, very important. Uh, so it's, you know, again, it's a simple framework. It's got some definitions, uh, but it, it also helps to reassert and redefine what are some of the key areas for health systems. So that's really all the models I want to show you. It, it's a very quick run through. I hope that you'll you'll be tempted now to go and do some further reading to understand with some depth these different models, how they've evolved, what what were the kind of the pros, the cons, the strengths, the weaknesses, 
you know, also what was the real impact on, on society in shaping health and health care? So here are just a few of what I would say are the takeaways that I want you to have from this lecture today. First of all, there is clearly a recognition of the importance of health systems. We need to be able to get beyond tactics. We cannot approach something as important as our health and health care using tactical approaches. So having systems thinking, a way to conceptualize and think about health systems is imperative. And as you go through your coursework and you think more and more about health, remember always to bring it up to that strategic level. What, what are the priorities? How do we organize things? What are the decisions? What are the trade-offs? Because invariably in every country, in every health system, there are trade-offs and decisions to be made. So that's an important takeaway. The different frameworks give you a starting point, as I said, for really analyzing health systems and understanding them. But moreover, what are gonna be the barriers to reforms? As we look into different areas and we go forward, how will we be able to reshape and rethink health systems? And what are the kind of complexities and things that may stop us from being able to really get to the place, you know. I hear lots of people talk about for the last, you know, kind of 20 or 30 years, I've been really, you know, talking about finance and the importance of, of getting the financial piece right. And we're still not there. So, um, you know, how do we shape those priorities? What are the th two, three things that really in your lifetime, health systems and health need to be focused on to really make a difference to mankind, uh, humankind, sorry. Sometimes complexity brings about better thinking. And um, so don't shy away from the fact that there are models out there that are much more complex. And you might even come up with your own model. Uh, I, I believe that it's through complexity. It's through interdisciplinarity. It's through you know, really letting down the barriers that we can come up with really the best ideas, the best thinking. And, and of course, the best outcomes, the best outcomes for all of us to have healthy um, lives and good health, of course, is a lot cheaper than bad health. So I think don't shy away from complexity um, and recognize, yes, the health system is becoming more complex. There are more actors. There are more people getting involved, but that's a good thing. But what we need to do with that, though, is think about how do we collaborate? How do we turn that into a, a coherent hull that works best for everyone? Uh, and then, of course, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention that through this period, we've had two key opportunities. We had the Millennium Development Goals that were agreed uh, through the United Nations in 2000 to be delivered in 2015. They were an attempt really to get agreement across you know, that kind of global governance, global health system on a number of areas that were hoped to address poverty and inequality in the world. We didn't get there, but it's through those attempts, through that evolution, through our discussions, through our communications, through working as a community, whether it's private, public, uh, you know, hospital, uh, community care, social care, we've got to come together and really take things forward. So I'm very pleased that one of the uh, mission and part of what the Global Business School for Health is around sustainable development goals. And again, it's an opportunity. It's not just about health systems, but it's, uh, you know, really 17 interlinked kind of global goals really designed to bring about better futures for humans. And one of the most important goals for us uh, as a, a community here in the Global Business School for Health, of course, is goal number three, which is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So although we're still searching for a perfect health system, we, the search needs to continue on. We need to keep looking at other systems and uh, both at the national level, we need to understand how do we need to evolve? How do we need to reform organizations like the World Health Organization to empower them to really work with us uh, and work across systems in a better, more functional way? There's much that we can learn from the past century as we move forward,
But more importantly, we need to continue to redefine what health systems are and how they work. So what are the lessons that we can learn and, and the big takeaways I'd like you to have from this lecture today? Well, there are definitely critical areas that need addressed to sustain accessibility, efficiencies, and quality of health systems. Healthcare approaches that just focus on healthcare delivery are never going to get us there. They're not enough. The health challenges currently and in the future really take a focus on health. We are really need to be in uh, health management. Uh, disease specific approaches, although they're needed at times and we've seen that, we've seen it with HIV and AIDS, we've seen it more recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, but those interventions cannot replace a systems approach because they are only delivered, as we've seen across you know, the world through the COVID-19 pandemic, that they are only enabled through the strength of health systems. So we need to ensure that we're focusing you know, on all of those functional areas, that we've got that kind of wider context for health systems, um, and that we also think about health systems in terms of politics, patients, social values, it's all integrated into a, a, a wider uh, a sphere. And we can't take a narrow kind of public health view because health systems are um, also market oriented. And so, yes, there are some systems that are more at one end of the spectrum and some that are at others, but it's only through really leveraging everything that we can and thinking about health systems as a, a whole, as a health ecosystem, that we can really make a, a, a difference as a community. So the future of health and healthcare cannot look like the past. It has to look different. We can't be hostages to the past, but we can learn a lot from what has gone on before us. So as you go through this uh, module, you're gonna get the opportunity to uh, hear a lot about some different country case studies. I hope you'll find them very interesting. I think they will challenge you to look for, you know, best practices, ways that we can contextualize, think about the broader political economy at the national and global level as we start to, to really make a difference and aspire to really achieve that sustainable development goal number three. So again, what we really want to do is work as a community, think strategically, Think systemically, think about what are those priorities that we need to address first to get things right, to enable our health systems so that we can ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages. And that's essential to really sustainable development. So thank you so much for listening. I hope, again, you enjoy the module. And uh, really, it's been uh, great having this opportunity to speak to you. Take care. Thank you.